with us, dining with us, and enjoying wonderful Nova Scotia experiences with us. So um, I'm going to hand it off to Ross, and he can uh, dive right into the content. But uh, I'm looking forward to the participation from everybody today. And we will be coming out with um, uh, an evaluation for participants to complete and send feedback to us around these webinars. So we're looking forward to the commentary around that as well. And of course, we would love to have all of our participants today be taking part as well in the uh, mentoring program, which is also available as part of the technology project. So don't hesitate to reach out to the Tyans office uh, afterwards and let to myself or Tiffany Hart uh, here at the office uh, assist you with any of those needs. Thanks very much. And um, I'll hand it off to you, Ross. Thanks a lot, Lisa. Much appreciated. Um, really looking forward to this. I love chatting with tourism operators and people who are trying to um, do great things right here in Nova Scotia and throughout the province. Um, before we do dive in, just a little bit of housekeeping. I see that a few people are um, putting in their comments under the section that says questions. Uh, to clarify, there should be another section that says chat. If you want to communicate with the other operators and other people who are taking part in the webinar, if you go down to that section, you will be able to have an actual dialogue with everybody who's here um, and be able to engage back and forth with one another. The questions section where um, I see you guys adding your comments um, specifically, that's for kind of adding questions that you might have as the session takes place. So if I'm talking about something that you don't necessarily know, you can submit your question and I'll be able to come to that at the end of the webinar um, and actually respond directly to those questions. So if you can use the chat, um, it might take a little bit of work to kind of figure out exactly where it is, but it should be in the same little platform that the questions is in. Um, that would be great. So before I dive in, um, another little piece of housekeeping. Uh, the webinar itself will be recorded, so it will be um, available for you guys afterwards along with the slides. So um, if I do fly through one or two slides and you're unable to take any notes, um, don't sweat it. The entire webinar series will be available for download later on. Um, might be on YouTube, not 100% sure of the logistics yet. Um, but that will definitely be available. So for those of you who are not very familiar with me and my background, um, I've been working in the tourism space for probably about five years, been working with the social media space before social media was actually called social media. Um, it really began when I was in university. I started my very first blog um, and I started an online forum all about football. Um, that was really the beginning of my obsession with technology, but also what opened up my eyes to see that this social media thing was actually going to stick around and that it was something that um, would impact and change the world. From there, I spent uh, probably about three and a half years working with advertising agencies throughout the city, um, working on a variety of tourism accounts. I think I probably worked with a lot of you over the past few years as well. Um, and then most recently, I struck out on my own to kind of become a digital marketing consultant, um, helping brands ranging from Fortune 500 companies to bed and breakfast to startups uh, with their marketing and online presence. So that's exactly what we're going to be talking about over the course of these webinars. Um, it's going to be running over five weeks. So be sure to also um, attend the webinars coming up. Today, we're going to be focused on web presence, which is really just one element of this entire process called online marketing. Um, so we're going to be focused today on the web presence as a whole. And if you are in an industry that is outside of tourism, um, I still think that you'll be able to take a lot away from this session. Um, but because this is a tourism webinar, a lot of the examples, a lot of the case studies that we talk about will be very much tourism centric. Um, so to give you a quick rundown of some of the items that we will be discussing over the next few weeks, um, March 4th, next week, we'll be talking specifically around blogging and content marketing and how that can play a role in uh, your brand and how you're getting people to come to your bed and breakfast, to come to your hotel, to come to your restaurant, um, to come to experience your offering, whatever that may be. We're going to talk about how blogging and content marketing can affect that. We're also going to be spending time the week following talking about Facebook marketing. Now, everybody knows about Facebook. Everyone knows um, that it's the largest social network, but a lot has changed over time. Um, organic reach, for example, on Facebook has decreased significantly. So Facebook isn't the same Facebook that it was two, three years ago. Um, it's changed a lot, and we're going to talk about some of those changes and how it impacts tourism operators. Twitter, we're going to talk about on March 25th about how um, Twitter is impacting tourism and how you can use it effectively. There's a lot of great examples of 
organizations locally that are doing a great job on Twitter. And we'll be talking about those. We'll also be talking about some tips and tricks that will allow you to be more effective and use it um, in a great way. And then finally, on April 1st, April Fool's, um, we'll be talking about some of the newer networks. So we'll be talking about things like Instagram. We'll be talking about Snapchat and Pinterest and how all of these channels play a role also in one, establishing a web presence, but ultimately how they can how they can drive meaningful and measurable results for tourism operators. So what role does the internet play when it comes to tourism? Um, what role does the internet play when it comes to driving people to um, your business to actually make that sale? The internet plays a huge role. Um, we all know this. You're here because you know this. Um, and it's something that I've been preaching about for the past few years. I think at the end of the day, we've gotten to a point where it's no longer possible to deny the fact that the internet has changed the game. We all know that. The majority of bookings are taking place through the internet. The majority of research being done is taking place on the internet. And what I want to do is I want to just go through some of the stats that reiterate this point around how important it is um, to have an online presence and why this session is really what we started with because the web presence is really at the core of why you're being online. You're online using Facebook, using Twitter, using all of these channels because you want to have an online presence. And the reason why you want to have that online presence is because the consumer's buying behaviors are equipped to use the internet as a primary channel for research, for inspiration, and ultimately conversion. A few years ago, uh, it was actually last year, um, I spent some time in France. And while I was in France, I came across this website after a recommendation from a taxi driver who said, you should check out this place called Pizzeria Casa. So I checked this place out, I did a Google search, and I came to this website. Now, similar to what you're probably thinking when you look at this website, I wasn't too impressed. I thought to myself, wow, this is going to be the worst restaurant I've ever gone to. And that was because of the first impression that this website made on me. Um, this, is, this was the first result that came up on Google when I searched for them. It was this website. You can see that it says page one, page two, page three. This isn't a very um, brand-centric um, quality experience for me as a user. If I'm in that stage where I'm trying to decide between Pizzeria Casa um, and another restaurant and they have a better online experience, you can know for sure that I'm not going to be taking um, – I'm not going to be going to Pizzeria Casa solely because of this experience and because I can look at this and say, hey, if they're not willing to put in enough effort into their website, they're probably not going to put a lot of effort into their pizza. And this is the world that we live in today. People are making their judgments based off of your website, based off of what they experience first. And if they experience something that isn't a great experience, then they're not going to buy from you. They're not going to spend time looking further. Um, so what it, what you need to do is you need to ensure that that web presence that you have isn't a website that is circa 1992, and it's instead up to date with the current um, web standards, with the current approach, and you're really telling a message that will resonate with your audience. When it comes to the web and it comes to tourism, um, there's really a pretty pretty straightforward experience that most users and most people have. And it's easy for us as operators and as marketers to kind of get out of this mindset when we're working in the business. But as consumers, this is how we act. We all have gone on a trip. We've all done, um, whether it's a trip around the province, whether it's a trip out of town, we've all gone through this three-step process. Whether we think about it while we're going through it or not, it's definitely an experience that we go through. Um, and it all starts with inspiration. So the inspiration comes from a variety of different places. It could come from Pinterest, it could come from um, YouTube, it could come from watching a, a, a movie and you're seeing that somebody's spending time in um, Bali on The Bachelor, whatever that may be. You could be getting your inspiration from any source of tourism experience, um, whether it's talking to friends and a friend sharing photos on their Facebook about um, where they spent their afternoon, or a friend on Instagram taking a picture of a nice meal that they had um, at a resort and uploading that to their Instagram account for their friends to see. Whatever that may be, that's inspiration. So what we need to do is we need to recognize that this is something that's happening regardless of whether or not we're using social media or not. And what we have to do is say, while we can't control the conversation taking place in this space, we can definitely influence it. So what we need to be thinking about is how can we have people Pinteresting um, our content? How can we have people tweeting about our content? How can we get 
um, our own restaurants being written about in Huffington Post on BuzzFeed? Um, how can we have videos uploaded to YouTube? What content can we put out there in the world that can influence that inspirational step? And then from there, it gets into research. So the majority of travel decisions start online. They start with Google. They start with the research of somebody going to Google and typing in, where should I stay in Halifax? Where should I stay in Yarmouth? Where should I stay in Truro? That's where their Google search starts. From there, they're going to visit sites like TripAdvisor, Yelp, Urban Spoon. And they're also going to probably go to their social media accounts and ask their friends and family members what they think. This is the research step. So after they've been inspired and they've said, okay, this is a destination where I want to go, they then go into a research mode where they're actually looking for specific details. They're looking at reviews. They're looking at um, comments that you may leave on those reviews. They're diving into the details of your organization and get a better understanding of whether or not you are someone who they should be giving their money to to experience what you're offering. And then finally, it's the conversion. This is where the decision takes place. It's where somebody actually says, I'm going to buy, I'm going to make a purchase, and this is where your website plays the biggest role. If you have a website, um, it's important that your website can drive and actually facilitate that sale. It should actually facilitate this entire process. Your website should be a place where inspiration can happen, where research can happen. And then finally, it should be a place where the decision can take place and ultimately that conversion and that sale um, transcends and actually um, occurs. So that's the three-step process. Um, before I dive into um, a few examples of how you can optimize your web presence, let's start by talking about some of the metrics that kind of just clearly demonstrate how the web has changed tourism as a whole. Google Think, uh, which is a great resource, um, the slides will be up online. I strongly recommend that you check out this bit.ly link that I um, included here. But it highlights all of the different behaviors as it relates to consumers and when they're planning their trips. So 65% of people who are traveling from a leisure standpoint generally begin their search, um, begin their research um, online. So that is 65% of the people who would be looking to take a leisure trip anywhere in the world start it by going online. They're going to Google, they're going to Facebook, they're going to TripAdvisor, they're starting their search by figuring out uh, where they should be going, where they should be staying online. And sure, somebody coming to Nova Scotia might not be dressed like that right now, um, but we know that they have a laptop in front of them when they're doing their research. 69% of business travelers also start their research online. When it comes to who actually influences people the most. It's their family, it's their friends, and it's their colleagues. Um, that place that that takes place um, would be offline. So sure, while we can preach about the internet is changing the world, there's still a significant impact that family and friends have when they're just sitting around a dinner table and they're having conversations. So it, that word of mouth is still one of the most powerful things. Um, the internet is simply word of mouth on steroids because the conversations aren't happening within your circle. It's happening with people from um, miles and miles away. So people who you don't necessarily know. But in terms of the source itself, um, they're both 56% of people would identify these as being their number one source of inspiration when they're looking to travel in a leisure um, manner. But search engines actually fuel that entire inspiration process. So if you were to think, where does that, where does that research begin? Where does the inspiration process begin? It starts with search. It starts by people going to um, search engines. It, taught, it starts with them um, actually using search to identify where they should stand, where they should stay, identifying where they should go. Um, beyond that, it's social networking. So we're going to talk about social networking a lot as well over the course of this session. Um, but social networking sites such as Facebook, Twitter, um, photo sites such as Flickr, um, Pinterest, all of these sites as well truly drive the fuel for the inspiration process. So in recognizing this, 83% of people are using social networking sites, video sites, photo sites. 61% are using six search engines. We have to recognize that the internet has changed the game and we need to have a presence there if we want to compete on a global scale. Video content is also a part of the inspiration process. So when people are going through that inspiration process, 65% of leisure travelers um, watch videos when they're thinking, just thinking about taking a trip. 48% 
think about it when they're trying to figure out what type of trip they should take, whether or not it should be of high adventure, whether it should be more Zen and yoga esque. Um, 48% of people look at travel videos when they're trying to make that decision. And then finally, 61% use video when they're actually looking for a destination. So when they're trying to determine whether they should stay in Nova Scotia, whether they should go to New Brunswick, they're using video um, as a primary method of gathering that inspiration. So once the inspiration is done, you actually start diving into the planning stage and you're actually you're starting to dive in and start figuring okay this is where we're going to stay this is what we're going to do while we're there um, how does that take place well 74 percent of all planning starts with the internet um, when it comes to the leisure travelers business travel it's even higher 77 percent so people are using the web they're pinning um, content they're um, saving things to a word document they're printing off things from uh, websites, they're bookmarking, they're saving, they're doing all kinds of things to really plan their travel. So what we need to do again is we need to ensure that we have a presence there. And the presence that we have isn't similar to the one that I saw when I was in France. It's not a Circa 92 website. Search engines rule leisure, actual sites rule for business. Um, when you go to the online sources that are used the most in terms of travel planning. For leisure travelers, they primarily use the search engine. Business travelers will actually go to the actual website um, to make their decisions. So they will go to your website, they will see what uh, prices you have, they will see what experiences you're talking about, and then they'll go to the search engine to really figure that out. So again, all this is doing is reiterating the importance of having that online presence. So where, what do you actually type in? What do these users type in when they first start to plan their trip? The majority of people are typing in the location. The location is always the first thing that people type in. And we'll talk about this later, but it's important that you include the location on your website somewhere. You'd be surprised how often I come to a website from a local operator and nowhere on their homepage does it say that they're, they're located in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. That is huge for Google on its own. Google will connect those words, Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, to anyone who searches for hotels in Yarmouth um, and then put you on the front page because you have that location. Destination, also one of the most popular things. That goes back to the um, high level place. So there's the city, which would be considered like a location, and then there's the destination, which would be considered your province. Um, they talk about hotels as being one of the most searched things, where people are actually going. A lot of people type in cheap, um, we can't deny the fact that most of us are cheap when it comes to spending our money. Um, we don't want to spend an arm and a leg to go somewhere. So we are going to type in cheap hotels. We're going to type in um, cheap restaurants or places that, are, that we can get a great bang for our buck. That's what's going to happen. Cheap flights, cheap deals, restaurant deals, hotel deals. Those are the types of things that people are searching for. And I'm going to show you a few tricks of the trade that will allow you to have a better understanding of what people are searching for when they're looking specifically for your business as well um, as we go through this webinar. So the question to ask is, do you show up on Google? Um, when people search for Halifax restaurants, does your restaurant show up? If somebody does a search for Halifax hotels or Yarmouth hotels, Digby hotels, uh, places to stay in Digby, do you show up? If you don't, then I'm glad you're here because I'm going to show you how you can. Um, a lot of the tips here um, are very straightforward. Some of them you'll be able to implement yourself. Some of them might require a little bit of research on your own um, where you actually have to do the implementation and kind of get into the back end of your site and make some changes. But for the most part, a lot of these changes that I'm going to show you today are going to be some quick and easy wins that will allow you to go from being on page 50 to page one. Um, if you are already on page one and you think that you're golden and you can get off of the call, I'm sorry, but you're actually not. Uh, there's a lot of changes that are taking place with Google that are pushing brands and organizations who were once on the first page even further down. Um, and I'm going to show you as well how you can continue to hold that number one spot um, and how you can ensure that you're not being knocked down through all of the changes taking place with Google. So what are the things that you need to know? Um, when it comes to your website presence, again, this is only about your website specifically. This is about what happens when people search for you. We've already talked about how many people are using search to find and plan their trips. We talked about that. We know that. So what I want to show you is that um, the number one way to kind of influence that 
is to have your website show up at the top. It's to have your website as one of those first results. And the things that you need to know are around site structure, um, the quality of content on your website, information and titles, having a proper URL structure, including relevant keywords throughout your website, and then finally, Google listings. Now, I put the number six there twice. That was completely by mistake. Um, but that should be uh, number five and number six. So we'll dive into these and these should unlock the keys to success for how you can uh, reach the first page of Google earlier. So I'm hoping that you get, I saw a message that you guys can't read the text. Um, if you can read the text now, um, just let me know. Um, I hope that you can. Uh, again, similar to what I was saying earlier, all of the slides will be available for download afterwards. So if you want to check them out, you can. Um, but I'm going to continue to go through, um, and I hope that you'll be able to see most of the words as we go through here. So the basic website layout should start with a home page. Uh, so when you go to a website, you need to come to a home page. And this is what Google uses to identify the structure of your site and to identify what pages are actually the most relevant. So from a homepage perspective, this is what somebody experienced the first time that they get there. The first time that they land on your site, they're looking to learn more about you, this is your homepage. From there, you have your main sections. And these main sections are also very, very important. And I'm gonna show you why they're very important shortly. But let's say, for example, you're a restaurant. You're going to have these next, this next stage of sections as being things like your menu. You're going to have your location. You're going to have um, about us, our story, our history, things of that nature. And then below that, you're going to have content that would be called your subsections. So within your subsections, you might have things like your gluten-free menu. You might have a dessert menu. You might have a wine menu. You might have all of these different things, and those would be considered subsections. It's very important that you understand the structure of your site. You need to understand, okay, if this is your homepage, what are the pages that people would most likely go to next? And then from those pages, what would be the content that people would consume after that? Some people solely have main sections and they don't have subsections for their site. That is completely okay. Um, everybody's site is going to be different because everybody's business is going to be different. Some of you have amazing stories that have hundreds and hundreds of years of history, while others um, do not. So what you need to do is you need to recognize, okay, um, everybody's website is going to be different. Everybody's going to have a different amount of subsections. So there is no cookie cutter approach, but there is a bit of best practice. So if you take a look at this one, for example, this is a hotel. Um, if you are a hotel, um, I'm sorry if you can't see the screen and you can't read the words, but I'll try to describe it for you in terms of what I'm seeing and what I'm trying to show you, is the first one would be your homepage. Um, from your homepage, you're going to have a few different sections. So you're gonna start within a boat. And then from that about page, you're going to have a page that is all about your hotel itself. It's going to tell the story about it. It's going to talk about the history. It's going to talk about awards and testimonials. That's sub content. You're also going to have a section called location. From there, you're going to have a section called finding us, which could just be a description of how you can find us. And then below that, you're going to have destination highlights. So that's where you're describing things that are within the vicinity. Is there a place that's close by um, where you can catch a concert? Is there a place close by where you can get a coffee? Any of that would be considered subcontent for your location. And Google scans all of this. Um, you would have your rooms. You would have activities and wellness. Within that, you would talk about your spa. You would talk about a gym. You would talk about an outdoor activity, so on and so forth. Google scans all of this content and then it delivers it back to users. So if I'm a user and I'm going to Google and I'm searching hotels with a gym, because you have a gym directly um, in your sitemap, Google is going to take that and it's going to deliver that as a result to me. So it's important that you have this site structure and you understand what your site structure really is. Um, again, this is all going to be available, but for you to actually submit this to Google in case you haven't before, if you go to Google, of course, and you actually Google how to sub submit a sitemap to Google, it will give you a result um, that tells you exactly how to do this. Um, but this is something that I strongly recommend um, that you consider doing. And again, the slides will be available so you'll be able to take this URL um, and dive in yourself. The next piece is quality content. Um, 
one of the biggest things and the most important things, and we're going to talk about this a lot over the next few weeks, is the importance of having quality content. And quality content doesn't just mean um, having great blog posts. That's not what quality content is about. It's about having great content even when I come to your site. It's about having a relevant message. So when I come to this site, for example, I'm seeing beat the winter blues and I look behind me and I see that the snow is coming down now. So I'm very much more likely to actually buy from these guys because they're telling me a story that resonates with me. Beyond that, they have an amazing visual. And I think that that's one thing that is often overlooked um, is the power of visual and the power of images. Um, I know that through NSTA, there's a lot of, um, there's a library essentially of visuals and images of all the different regions that you guys can capitalize on and use on your sites, um, that you can use on social media, that you can use on um, a variety of different channels that would truly allow you to take your brand to the next level. So you need to tap into that as an opportunity to truly have quality content on your website. But if you dive deeper into this website, you'll see that they have quality content in the sense of their location. So instead of them just simply typing out what their address was, they give you a description. They say that the resort is situated on the southwest coast of Sicily. They are very descriptive in describing where it's at, what airport's close by. Um, they talk about their guests. They talk about private cars. This is quality content. And Google scans all of this content as well. So by you ensuring that this content is available on your site, Google's going to give you a thumbs up and it's going to increase your likelihood of showing up on the home page. These guys go above and beyond. They also show you the floor room, the floor plans for their facilities. So they have meeting rooms and they're showing you the floor plans. And for every single one of those, they have descriptions. They describe the meeting rooms in um, very in a lot of detail. They talk about how many um, tables are available. They talk about the um, projector setup. They describe them in detail. They talk about their Wi-Fi. They talk about the video conferencing technology. They have spent the time to create content that Google will enjoy and that they know that their users will enjoy as well. This is another hotel. Um, you take a look at this site and sure it seems a little weird and very artsy, um, but what I want to focus on is on the left hand side you can see all of the types of content that they've gone out and created. They have a, a section called our universe, our rooms, our services, our offers, they have a media gallery, they have the location, they have a news, press, contact, um, they have all of the details that somebody would want when they come to a website. And ensuring that this content is being delivered in a, with an effort is really the most important thing. So they don't just describe themselves and say, um, the Chess Hotel opened in 2014, um, thanks for visiting our site. They actually describe what the hotel is all about. They take the time to actually talk about the atmosphere. They take the time to talk about um, the benefits of staying here, how it's quiet how um, it's, a, a, it's away from all of the hustle and bustle of the city. That's what you need to do when you're describing your site. And in doing so, you'll be able to connect with Google and ultimately connect with your users. So again, this is another section. They have Discover Our Services, a section where it's all about the different services that they offer, um, fitness, relaxation, and beauty. And then they have minor little paragraphs below it that describe exactly what those things are. By doing this, what they're able to do is, again, they're able to give a handful of conversation, a handful of content to their audience and ultimately increase their chances of showing up on Google. So let's go back to the Chess Hotel for a second. So one thing that I pointed out was those titles on the left-hand side. And a lot of people don't recognize this, but what Google does is it takes those titles, it takes those navigation items, and it looks at those first. Those are the first thing it looks at to identify how relevant this site is to a specific industry. So they scan this site, let's say for example. They see the word our universe. They have no idea what that means. These guys don't know this. They're not on the webinar. But Google looks at our universe and ignores that completely because it's a vague word. Then they see the words our rooms. They're like, okay, that's interesting. It might be a hotel. It might be a motel. It might be a bed and breakfast. Then they see that it says our services. Okay, don't really know what that means. Let's keep going. Our offers. Okay, offers is something that a lot of hotels do. Um, this is probably a hotel. Then it goes into location and then it goes into contact and it's quickly able to say, okay, this is a hotel. From that, what Google does is it takes those items and it will deliver them as being um, subsections 
in the Google results. So if you type in Hampton Inn, for example, you'll get the URL at the top that says Hampton Inn, but below that, you'll have the titles of some of those key things that were on your website. So for the chess, they're gonna have our rooms, they're gonna have our offers, they're gonna have location, they're gonna have contact showing up in these places where the Hilton has make a reservation, seniors save up to 10%, download our app, AAA membership discount. Those are the things that are going to be pulled from Google. So it's important that you have those elements included in your website, um, and it's important that you submit your sitemap um, because Google really bases the majority of it off of the titles that you have on your site and the items that you have identified as being the most important. One key thing that I've noticed people missing and that we cannot overlook is the importance of having the location directly in your home page's description. So if you look at the old triangle, when I typed in pubs in, in Halifax, the old triangle Irish ale host shows up number one for one reason and one reason only, because in their title, they have listed Halifax NS, Halifax. So they're saying Halifax twice and it's in their title. So when I go to Google and I type it in, Google's saying these guys must be relevant because they have Halifax written in there twice and they have Nova Scotia. So not only are they talking about the city, but they're also talking about the province. So to Google, they're saying these guys are probably the best result. Let's deliver this user with that result. As you scroll down, you see that the second one that's an actual pub um, is Maxwell's Plum. And Maxwell Plum is showing up as number two as an actual pub, but the reason why they're not number one is because they didn't include NS. So they have Halifax Pub in there, that's great, that's awesome, but if they had Nova Scotia in there, it would increase their chances of showing up as well. And then finally, we have Dirty Nellies, um, an authentic Irish pub. It doesn't include the word Halifax, it doesn't include the word Nova Scotia, and as a result, it's not number one. It's not passing Maxwell's Plum until that title is actually updated to be descriptive enough to include the location. So that's a quick and easy hack that um, you can use to ensure that you're showing up. So if you're a hotel or a bed and breakfast in Yarmouth, make sure that Yarmouth is written in your title. If you're in Digby, make sure Digby, Nova Scotia is in your title because it could be the difference between being number one on Google and being number five. The next step is to recognize the proper URL structure. So your proper URL structure is actually just your website, www.yourhotel, your bed and breakfast, your experience, your restaurant.com. Um, that's what your URL is. And what Google does is it scans your URL to also identify what keywords are in it and whether or not this is something they should be delivering back to your users. So the first thing that you have is the protocol, and that's just www. Um, it's important that you have that in your URL for um, promotion materials and things like that. But when it comes to SEO, it's not really that important. The next piece is domain. And this is really important. So this is what you actually call yourself. So if you call yourself um, the if you call yourself uh, the chess hotel like we had before, then you better have the URL that says www.chesshotel.com. Um, it's important that your domain is very much aligned with what it is that you're offering, with your product, with your brand. Um, it's very important that it's very much aligned with that, or when you people do a search, you're less likely to show up. So you want to ensure that your URL is very much aligned with what you're actually offering. Then you have your top level domain. Google looks at this to identify whether or not you're Canadian or whether or not you're American, whether you're from the UK. I always recommend that you have a .com. If you can't get a .com, .ca is also very important. Um, and then there's also URLs that are coming out like .co, .co, um, which are also just as, just as great. Um, in terms of priority, I would say always get .com and .ca. If you can, that would be ideal. And then from there, if neither of them are available, you would look at getting something like .co. Um, there are also new URLs and domains coming out like .hotel. They're a little bit wonky right now, not 100% sold on them, but I think it's an idea worth considering. And if you have a hotel or if you have a bed and breakfast and you want to buy .bnb or .hotel, I'd say buy it just in case um, it becomes something more intriguing and relevant down the road. Number four is what Google would use to really understand what it is they're looking at. So they would say, okay, this person says rooms. That means we're on a section all about the rooms at this hotel. 
And then finally the page, which would be a honeymoon suite or whatever that may be. And then Google would scan that and say, okay, clearly at this hotel in the room section, there is a honeymoon suite. So we can deliver that back to our users as well. Now, one thing that a lot of people make the mistake of doing when it comes to optimizing their site for search is they tend to plug a lot of keywords in. And I've been on many sites time and time again where there has been more keywords than I've known what to do with. And I think that that's one of the biggest mistakes you can make. You should not stuff your website content with keywords just for the sake of doing it, just for the sake of optimizing your site. Because at the end of the day, what's gonna happen is when somebody goes into your conversation, when somebody is trying to engage with you, they're not going to, they're not going to actually buy from you if they're reading text that is saying the same thing over and over and over again. I know that the chat isn't actually working right now, apparently. So feel free to use the questions um, as a way to actually have those conversations and communicate back and forth. Um, and then at the end of this, all we'll figure it out. So next time the chat is actually working um, completely. But back to the keywords piece. Do not use keywords over and over again. If you do that, guys, what you're going to face um, is a poor user experience. And that's, that's one of the most important things for having a great user experience. If somebody comes to your website and they're not able to have a truly compelling and great experience because you've stuffed the word hotel in every single sentence, people are going to bounce. They're going to leave. They're not going to stay on your site. Um, and they're not going to actually buy from you. So you're going to damage the experience more than anything. So be careful with your keywords, but you do want to plan for them. Strategically placing keywords is important. And if you go to Google again, and you type in AdWords Keyword Planner, um, and you sign up for this thing called AdWords, it will allow you to actually search out what keywords people are using when they're coming to your site which is very important. It allows you to really get a better understanding of what keywords are gonna be relevant to your audience and what keywords you should be using on your website. So we already know that we should be using things like location, but you can dive deeper and start understanding whether or not people are searching for affordable hotels. You can find out if people are using that as an actual word when they go to Google. You can find out if people are searching for vegan restaurants. You can find out if people are looking for gluten-free restaurants, whatever that may be, find those keywords that are relevant to your audience, um, concerts, events, whatever that may be, and inject it within your website. So this is an ugly screenshot, and it looks very complex and crazy, but I'm going to do my best to explain to you exactly what's going on here. So these are the places where you want to ensure your keywords are showing up. If you ensure that your keywords are at least showing up somewhat in these places, um, you're going to have a better chance of showing up on Google. So the first item that you see here is the URL permalink. And that's what we talked about before. Um, this is from Wikipedia. They have the keywords directly in it that say search engine optimization. So Google is going to automatically say, okay, this is from Wikipedia and it has the word search engine optimization. That's a keyword that we know is important. From there, they're going to look at your title tag. And your title tag is what you see at the top of your browser when people, when you're on a website. As you can see, the title tag for this page is search engine optimization. So if you type in search engine optimization on Google, again, this is what's actually going to show up in that result. So you want to ensure that your keywords are showing up there. A few slides back, we showed the ones with Maxwell's Pub. It said Maxwell's Pub, a Halifax pub. It showed up there in Google because that's what was in the title tag. If you change this text to include your location, um, to be a keyword that is being highly searched, it's going to increase your chances of showing up in search. And then you get into the actual on-site content. So there's two different layers of text. There's your header text and then there's your copy text and your paragraphs. Um, your header text needs is the text that has the bigger words, it's bold, um, it's usually an H1 if you wanted to get into the technical term of it. Um, and this is where you need to also ensure that you're having your headlines um, optimized. So for a hotel, this would say something like room rates. This would say something like about us, whatever that may be. It would be something that is specifically um, related to your company, to your organization, 
that has keywords within it. So a restaurant would say um, gluten-free menu as their head headline. And then if somebody did a search for gluten-free in Halifax or gluten-free in Yarmouth, Cape Breton, it would show up in Google because of that. Then you have the actual body of copy. So this is where you're going to describe your business, where you're going to describe your organization, um, the experience you offer. So let's say, for example, you offer um, kayaking. Within this text, you might be talking about all the lakes, all the rivers around Nova Scotia. Um, you might be talking about sea kayaking. You might be talking about um, Shubenacadie, whatever that may be. You're talking about all of these things. When you write the word kayak, Google takes that as a word that they see as being relevant to users who are searching for Halifax um, kayaking experiences, um, Eastern Shore kayaking experiences, whatever that may be. If you have the word kayak in your content over and over again, it's going to be an indicator for Google. If you have links within your content, the link back to other pages within your site. So that would be something like this here where it says anchor text and internal links. If you link one of those words that say kayak to um, another page on your site, all about kayaks, Google will say, okay, this person really has a lot of content on kayaks. We're going to ensure that this website is being distributed and delivered to anyone who searches for kayaking in Nova Scotia. And then finally, one thing that's often overlooked is images. Um, over on the left-hand side where you see that Wikipedia globe, Within that text, within that image is what they call alternative tags. Um, an alternative tag is a word that you associate with an image. So if somebody did um, update this site to have um, some alternate tags associated with this photo, Google can't scan an image. They don't know how. It's not possible yet. But what they can do is they can scan the text that you've associated with an image, and that's how they've determined what shows up in Google Images. So the alternate text on this would be the Wikipedia logo, and then it would increase the chances of that showing up um, on search as well. So the next piece that's really important is Google listings. So what Google listings is, if you've ever been on Google lately um, and you type in something, you might notice that on the right-hand side, it's showing the reviews, it's showing your hours of operation, it's showing your prices, it's showing your phone number, your address, it's even showing photos. And in all honesty, you guys, if there's one thing that you should take away from this session, one thing you need to implement within the next 48 hours kind of thing, it would be this. It's very easy to do. You go to Google, you claim your profile, and you're able to take control over that result and what's showing up there. A lot of people have the wrong address still listed on Google Maps. Take control of that. You need to ensure that that is updated. There's nothing worse than starting an experience with a customer and them ending up in um, Timbuktu instead of showing up in Ecom Um You need to ensure that the content that you have on Google Maps is actually relevant. Update your phone number update your hours, and also include a URL directly to your site because that's where that conversion is going to happen. Um, you can also upload photos. This is something that you need to take control of. To do that, all you need to do is you um, type in your restaurant, type in your hotel, type in whatever it may be that you operate and own, and on the right-hand side, it'll show um, a result for that. If it does show that up, you click on it, and then you're able to say, um, take management of this account and then you can control it and you can optimize it as you wish. Um, it's also important to do because there's going to be reviews. Uh, Google listing takes reviews directly from um, your TripAdvisor, your Yelp account, and it features them directly in your Google listing. So it's important that you are managing this, that you're ensuring that it's sorted by those that are the most helpful and not those that are um, the most negative. And you're ensuring that that experience that people are getting when they go and search for you um, is a positive one and one that tells the story that you actually want them to tell. Um, there's also an app that's available on Google Play, also on the App Store, that allows you to manage this directly. Uh, if you go to Google My Business app, um, if you search that, you'll be able to actually update this and manage it. You'll be able to update your map itself. You'll be able to take control of that experience and ensure that it's not something that is negative um, and that it's a positive experience for your users. Another way to drive uh, traffic to your web presence is Google AdWords. Uh, ads are all over Google lately. It's not necessarily a great thing. It's something that um, is starting to annoy a lot of people. 
Um, if you do email me, I do have a uh, easy promotion that I've been able to get from Google just from some of the work that I've done with AdWords lately where I can give out $100 free AdWords credit. Um, if you want this, feel free to send me a note. Um, you get $100 free AdWords if it's your first time um, doing AdWords. Uh, just drop me a line afterwards. The reason why AdWords is important is because look at this result. If I did a, re I did a quick Google search for a company called Wealthfront and the majority of the text that happens on that first screen is all ads. 468% um, of the screen is Google AdWords. Um, one result right here down at the bottom um, is actually from SEO and from optimizing your site. So what's important is that you say, okay, if Google is giving up all of this space to ads um, on AdWords, it's important that I'm showing up as number one, but it's also important that I'm starting to recognize this shift and that I'm playing to win. But at the end of the day, guys, I know this might sound like a lot. It might be complicated, and it really is. Um, but there's a lot of quick wins that you can do there, whether it's the keywords, adding those to your site, whether it's submitting your sitemap, whether it's updating your Google listing, um, all of those little things that you can do can make a significant difference in your web presence. But your web presence is much bigger than your website. Your website is really just one piece of the entire puzzle. Um, your web presence is Facebook. Uh, what experience do people get when they're visiting your, web, your Facebook page? What experience are people getting when they visit your Instagram account? Um, are people able to understand your product? Are people able to understand your your staff, are they able to understand what it is that you actually offer when they go to these different channels? It's blog posts, it's when other people write about you. Um, if other people are writing about you, that's impacting your web presence. All of this combined is what your web presence is all about. And over the course of the next few weeks, this is the stuff that we're gonna dive into. We're gonna dive deep, we're gonna dive into tactics, and we're gonna talk about some quick and easy wins that you guys can take to drive results from this stuff. Because it's also about things like TripAdvisor. And we have a full um, session that's going to be talking about TripAdvisor and the impacts of that as well. Um, we're going to dive into a lot of these things and how you can use them. Because when I go back to that first site that I showed you, uh, Pizzeria Casa, I'll be honest. When I went to their website, I wasn't sold. I looked at it and I said, these guys are weird. I'm probably not going to go there. But I kept digging. I did some more research. I did some more hunting. And I found this TripAdvisor page. And it had a four and a half star. They had 290 reviews, they had a certificate of excellence, and as you can see from the photo, the pizza looked great. So it wasn't just their website, it was their overarching web presence that converted me, and that's what allowed me to actually drive the sale. Um, I went there, had a great meal, stayed there many times, um, got to know the owners, that's the guy that was in that funny picture at the beginning, um, and it was hands down the best pizza I ever had, um, and I'm here talking about it still today. So. Your web presence is important. I'm going to show you guys how to ensure that your web presence is um, seamless across all channels. And I'm looking forward to the next few weeks. If you have any questions, feel free to drop them in the questions bar. Um, we have a couple minutes and I'll go through those and I'll answer anybody's questions. Thanks a lot, guys. No problem, Jennifer. Glad you enjoyed it. Thanks, Donna. Thanks, Sheila. Hope you can attend. Peter, I see your message. I'm going to check it out. Um, so I'm doing this on the fly. I see um, as questions come in, I'll definitely answer. Um, yeah, this is great. I see that the content is optimized. That's awesome. Um, Peggy's Cove Boat Tours. Perfect. You're doing a great job, uh, Peter, in terms of the SEO from first glance. I mean, this is definitely um, 
optimize for search. Thanks, Julie. Glad you enjoyed it. Do different names mean different things? Um, Don Smith, do different names mean different things? I'm not 100% sure what you mean. Glad you enjoyed it, Gina. Thank you. Good to hear, Linda. Yeah, Peter, great job with the site. Um, the, the SEO side is just great. I mean, this is spot on with what I'm talking about. I'd say the only thing to ensure of, and I'm not 100% sure because I haven't been able to geek out and dive into your code, um, but just make sure you've got a lot of rich images. Make sure that those images have some alt tags on them um, and they actually are optimized for search. Yes, this will be available for um, tape. It's going to be up online. Um, we're going to send out a message with the actual recording for everyone. The slideshow will be uploaded as well. Um, an email will be circulated, I believe, um, with all of the information. .edu and .org. Um, so now I understand what you're saying. So yes, different URLs mean different things. .edu um, are the considered the number one URL domain um, because they're education sites. So if you're an education site, uh, Google automatically says these people wouldn't link to anything that is not great content. Uh, they're an education site. So they would rank you as number one in terms of where you would want links um, from. So if, you if anyone has partnerships with universities, get those universities to link to you. If you have partnerships with anybody with a .edu website, Get them to link to you and it will do you wonders um, for your search results. Don Swift, uh, we couldn't get .com or .ca. The only thing we could get was .org. .org works. Um, I would say one other option would be to get .co as well. .org definitely works. It's a... Um, it's one of the early stages of domains. Uh, it works, it does the trick, especially if you can't get .com or .ca, but I would look into .co. Um, it's something that's really starting to pick up. Thanks, Amy. Uh, there's a comment here from uh, Wooter Roos. Um, asking about Google grabbing the actual reviews from websites such as TripAdvisor um, for listings and how those are not currently showing up for their site. What's important is that when you take control of your Google listing, that you include a link to your TripAdvisor account. In doing so, Google will be able to put two and two together that you are the owner of both this Google listing and this TripAdvisor account, and it will integrate them into the same search. Um, I'm going to try to do a quick search to see if one shows up. I don't know if it will. Um, uh, these are Google reviews. Yeah, it looks like a lot of these are showing up with just their Google reviews, um, but it also doesn't look like they have their um, TripAdvisor listing here. So you can see here they have these here, but they don't have their TripAdvisor connected. Um, if they included their TripAdvisor link, it would probably pull in their um, account. Exactly. Yes, Amy, great point around creating a business Wikipedia page. Uh, Wikipedia drives, again, very high quality links. If you're a place that has a great history um, and a great story, 
having a Wikipedia page is huge. Um, definitely recommend everyone try to set one of those up. Um, it can be tricky if you're a business that doesn't have a lot of history. Wikipedia might not allow you to create a page, but if you do have history, if you have an interesting story or even an interesting founder or owner, um, you'll have a great opportunity to generate some buzz and drive some quality links. Linda Harrington, we are in Mastown, but not many would search for a restaurant there. Should we use Turo as location keyword? Yes, I would say definitely. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, Wes has a question around any other search engines trending up. Um, there's a few. There's one called DuckDuckGoGo, um, and it started to recently pick up after the whole NSA scare where everybody's afraid that Google's spot, spying on them. Um, but it's not. no one's competing with Google right now. Um, they're, they've definitely grown, but they're not going to be able to overtake Google anytime soon. No one will. Oh, awesome. Yeah, Amy, if you've got 26 years under your belt, definitely do it. Yes, uh, Shanlin has the question around .gov. Same impact. Um, forgot about gov. Gov is probably even higher than edu um, because it's the government. Great. Well, thanks, guys. Um, doesn't look like there's any other questions that I missed. Really appreciate you guys taking the time to uh, join us on these webinars. Um, if you don't have any other questions, um, I'll let you guys uh, get back to it. Oh, I have one. If you don't show up on the right side of Google listing, Expedia, how do you get it? Get to it. Um, you have to... If you go into Google and you type in take control of Google listing, so yeah, if you just go into Google and you type in um, Google listing or even Google local, um, you get to this thing that says google.com slash business. And in doing that, you'll be able to um, actually go in and update your business account. Uh, there's n Carrie, I've seen your message around the Google reviews. There isn't um, a way to change that. You can sort the difference, but they are going to um, all show up. I think Lisa's on the line. Or Tiffany. There we go. I think we're on now. Yep, we can all hear you. Wonderful. So just want to say thanks so much to everybody for joining us for our first uh, webinar Wednesday. Uh, really great information being shared today, and I want to reinforce that for everybody that was on this uh, particular one to uh, uh, bear with us some growing pains as we figure out our chat slash question options. We'll do our best to have that straightened away for next week for everybody. We'll work with Ross to get the uh, recording prepared and shared with industry, of course. And um, for those of you that really enjoyed this session and, and are looking forward to the next one, we'd also like to encourage you to share this with your network. These are uh, free webinars that are being offered to tourism operators and organizations in partnership with the Nova Scotia Tourism Agency. It's all part of our Nova Scotia Technology Project and we're really excited to be able to try and offer some timely and relevant information to help support all of you with your digital strategies. So for those of you looking for some support one-on-one -on -one with your social media and your website mentoring specifically, don't forget to get in touch with myself, Lisa Sadar or T Tiffany Hart here at the Tyans office and we'd be happy to get you set up with a one-on-one -on -one mentoring including a review of your NovaScotia.com listing uh, which is an important part as well of your uh, tourism presence. So thanks everybody and thanks very much Ross. Great job.